So let's start with a story. And all good stories started a long, long time ago when there was nothing. So I'm taking you back about 14.6 billion years. And this is what the universe looked like. So all energy was concentrated in basically the tip of a needle. And we have no idea of how you get a density like that. And for some reason, we still don't understand why it blows up. And when it blows up, it begins spewing matter everywhere. And that matter begins to concentrate on these things we call galaxies. So you're now about 14 billion years into the story. And what's really interesting is as you come into one of these trillions of galaxies, it looks something like this. And what you're looking at is what they call a nebula. And there's dust and there's stars and stuff. And if you look at this picture, there's a little three little prongs right in the center of this. And if you take a close up of that, it looks like this. Now, the scale is a little bit larger than we're used to. So this is about 1.5 trillion miles per column. And what you're looking at is so much dust in here that each little piece of dust is attracting the other little piece of dust and, bite and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And the gravity eventually becomes so extraordinary that the pieces of dust fuse and the matter fuses. It ignites a thermonuclear reaction and you birth a star. So what you're actually looking at here on the tip of the left side of that is stars being born. And they float off. And they begin to create galaxies. You're now about one third of the way into this story. So this particular galaxy is important, not because it's a particularly big galaxy, not because it's particularly well placed, but simply because you are here. <clears throat> so this is our neighborhood. And in this story, what you're looking at is a not particularly distinguished star called the sun that's born about 4.6 billion years ago. So just to put it in context, you're now about two thirds of the way into this story before this thing ignites. And then what you have is enough dust left over and enough little pebbles that those eventually begin to coalesce into planets. So the dust that wasn't thick enough to become a star eventually becomes something that looks like this. And that's about four billion something years ago. And out of this primordial soup, <laughs> you almost immediately get life. So almost as soon as the planet is created, almost as soon as the planet comes together, life begins and it begins to evolve, and it begins to structure. And the interesting thing is then life goes kaput. <laughs> Just no more life. 99.9% .9 of life vaporizes. And we're still trying to figure out why in some instances. Some people think it was caused by an ice that was about two or three miles thick at the equator. In other instances, it may have been an asteroid or two but life went kaput five times. And as you think about that, what started to happen is you started getting increasing complexity of life. So life got more and more interesting, you got more and more variety, and after you wipe out 99.9%, .9%, you get this enormous explosion of diversity and evolution, and you get a whole pile of stuff coming out. Now, just to put it in context, about 99.96% of the history of the universe takes place before the first hominids show their ugly mugs. Right? Just, you are here, right? But it's kind of the end of the story so far. And as you're thinking of the implications of that, there's two theories of the case. Theory number one, that's all she wrote. Right? So the purpose of the universe, trillions of years, et cetera, is us. We become the be-all and end-all of evolution. Now, under that theory, one of the questions you might want to ask yourself is, trillions of galaxies, sextillions of planets, billions of years, and it all levels off with Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern.
that is the purpose of the universe right there. Okay, and then it flatlines. <laughs> well, that's one theory, right? But of course, the question you might ask yourself is, might that be just a little arrogant? Is it conceivable that these trillions of galaxies and six trillions of planets aren't just there to create your crazy cousin? And if that's the case, one of the things you also might wish to consider is we came darn close to being extinct. If the African drought had lasted a few more weeks, you would never have seen any more of these. Everybody in this room descends from one African mother. Most of you descend from one of seven European mothers. It costs about $99 to take a cheek swab and figure out which of those seven mothers. And as you're thinking of the implications of that, you might want to think about a second theory. And that second theory is, could we ever upgrade? <laughs> well, it's nice on planes. How about it as a species? And as you're thinking about that, is an upgrade possible? Well, you know, we've had 28 so far. There have been at least 28 versions of hominids, and we keep discovering them. In fact, last year we found a 29th. So we keep unearthing these various versions of humanoids. And by the way, while you're at it, you might ask why a single human species? Try a thought experiment for a second. Okay, imagine you see this bird. Beautiful bird. You see it out here. What happens if you go to Boston and you see the same bird? You go to the Amazon and you see the same bird. You go to the deserts and you see the same bird. You go to Antarctica and you see the same bird. Wouldn't that be a little weird if there were only woodpeckers in none of these? And by the way, there didn't used to be a single human species on the planet. In fact, we coexisted with at least seven of them. So it was actually normal to have various varieties of humans wandering around, not just us. And as you're thinking of the implications of that, one of the questions you might ask yourself is, how big does a mutation have to be to create the difference between a Neanderthal, a congressman, and a human being? Congressman, I don't know, but Neanderthals, this guy can give you the answer. So this is Svante Pavo. He works at the Max Planck Institute. And one of the things he's done is he's taken very small bits of degraded DNA out of the bones of Neanderthals, and he's laid them next to the DNA of humans. And he's found that the difference net between a Neanderthal and a human is about 0.004% of gene code. Absolutely minute difference generates a speciation. And by the way, we can tell you exactly which genes are the difference between Neanderthals and humans, and where they are and what they do. And as you're thinking of the implications of this stuff, we keep mutating. So about 10,000 years ago, we had a mutation in the HERC2 gene, which some people found attractive. And that's why you've got blue eyes. And that's spread in the last 10,000 years. So we keep evolving, we keep changing, we keep upgrading. And just for argument's sake, what might be next? So one of the really interesting things that's happening here today, and it's happening at your medical centers, it's happening in your biology labs, is we're putting in these massive sequencing machines. And what these machines do is you can stick in the DNA of anything. You can put in the DNA of a mouse, you can put in the DNA of a human, you can put in the DNA of an orange, of a bacteria and it gives you the code that that life form is made of. We had the first version of the human genome, rough version, about 2000. We had the first adiploid genome, which means really full genome, about two years ago. But what's gonna happen in the next 12 months is we're gonna get the first 10,000 human genomes because this technology is getting so fast and it's becoming so cheap. And one of the questions that we may be facing that none of us may be ready to ask answer, discuss, is what happens if we begin to find differences? It's perfectly normal for somebody over here to have an A blood type and an O blood type and an O negative blood type and an AB positive. 
what happens if we find differences between human genomes? For instance, if you have an ACE gene, then maybe with a lot of effort, you'll be able to climb an 8,000 meter peak without oxygen. But nobody's climbed an 8,000 meter peak so far without oxygen, without an ACE gene. And by the time you get to sports, well, let's talk about 577R variants of genotypes. It turns out every Olympic male power athlete has a copy of this. What does that mean for the Olympics? What do you want to make the London Olympics? Do you want the London Olympics to be a showcase for really hardworking mutants? <laughs> do you want to play the Olympics like golf or sailing? Where if you don't have this variant, you get a tenth of a second handicap? Or do you want to play it so that if you didn't happen to pick the right parents, you can upgrade so that you compete with a naturally occurring mutation with people who did pick the right parents? And as these questions spread and as technology spreads, the plastic surgery that takes place today is going to look like child's play compared to some of the stuff that's coming. You and your kids are going to have some choices that your grandparents couldn't have dreamed of. And as you're thinking about this stuff, you're beginning to mix a whole series of technologies. It's not one technology that's driving it. It's not one lab. It's not one place. It's not one scientist. It's not one area. It's thousands of distributed points, loosely connected pieces, each of which is there for a very good reason. But when you take the whole of this, the changes become pretty big pretty fast. Take cochlear implants. So think about your great grandparents. Okay? The, the way they dealt with hearing loss is they'd take a great big horn and they'd kind of point it. Your grandparents, they had these odd boxes that sat on top of their ears and squawked at odd times during dinner. Right? You get this high pitched, maybe your parents wear hearing aids, but you don't see them. Right? They're almost invisible. And what's been happening is even the deaf today can have a cochlear implant. And they used to hear about 40% of what would be a conversation. And a couple of years later, 50%. And a couple of years later, 70%. Today, they can hear almost as well as you and I can. But we're not going to evolve our hearing over the next 50 years. And these things are going to evolve. And it may get to the point where Somebody with a cochlear implant can hear what a dog is hearing or what a dolphin is hearing or can focus hearing on this part of the room or can hear with a greater acuity than you and I can. And it may be that sometime in 50 years you will not be hired by a symphony orchestra if you don't have an implant. And of course the same logic is beginning to apply across eyes. Which are far behind cochlear implants, but they're coming along. Maybe some people will be able to see an infrared or ultraviolet or telescopic vision. And while you're at it, we're beginning to print organs. So you can take, at Tony Atala's lab, a series of little HP ink cartridges and begin to print out things like skin or hearts. Let me tell you about something that happened in the last year. So this is one experiment. What the Chinese did is they took a few cells from this mouse, specifically this mouse, they put four chemicals on it, and they turned those skin cells of the mouse into a stem cell. A stem cell is what gets created when sperm and ova come together. There's one cell, and it can become every part of the body. Then there's two cells that are identical, four cells that are identical, eight cells that are identical, 16 cells that are identical. These are pluripotent stem cells that can become anything. Then they start to differentiate. And if you allow this mouse skin cell to continue to differentiate, it gives birth to an identical mouse. So you can now make a life form out of basically any cell in the body. And as you think of that, this is the way pluripotent stem cells work. So it's like being a skier at the top of the hill. You can go anywhere on that hill, but as soon as you commit, 
you go this way, you, maybe you become bone. If you go this way, then you become a platelet. This way, a macrophage. This way, a T cell. This way, maybe muscle. It used to be that once you were at the bottom, that was it. That was your body. But the implications of this experiment are you now have a ski lift based on these four chemicals that can take any cell back up to the top of the mountain. In highly scientific terms, that is sometimes referred to as a BFD. <laughs> you can now do this with fruit flies. So these are fruit fly cells that are differentiating into muscle and skin and neural tissues. And within the last year, you've done this with human sense skin cells. You can now turn human skin cells into stem cells. And you can allow them to begin to grow into things like liver cells. So this stuff is moving reasonably quickly. And as you think of the implications of this, think about a second experiment that also has taken place in the last year. This character has been trying to record everything he sees and hears throughout his life. That's interesting. That's electronic. What's more interesting is the stuff this guy's doing. So this is a really smart MIT genius. And what he's been doing is he's been taking a retrovirus, putting a fluorescent protein, like the stuff that fluoresces in the ocean or fluoresces in fireflies, and tagging a retrovirus that can then go and infect mice brain cells. Why is that a big deal? Because if you take that and infect mice brain cells, if you put light into a mouse brain, it fluoresces as the brain acts. So as the mouse feels, sees, touches, remembers, you light up the specific pathways. And what's interesting about this is he can now tag in two colors. So he can image in two colors. And by the way, you might have heard of this. This is binary code which means you can download the brain input into a computer in the language of the computer. Now, the consequences of that experiment are someday you might be able to download your own memories. And of course, if you can download your own memories, maybe you can download other people's. And if you take these two experiments together, it means you can make a photocopy of your body, in theory, from any one of your cells. And you might be able to download, eventually, some of the memories. That might have an implication or two. And as you're thinking about this stuff, this is a very tiny portion of how we are changing ourselves as a species. It's one chapter in this book that Steve Gullens and I wrote about Homo evolutus. We think we're moving from a Homo sapiens into a Homo evolutus, which, for better or worse, it's a hominid that begins to directly and deliberately control the evolution of its own and other species. I don't think there's a bigger trend on the planet. I don't think there's anything that will change us more. I don't think there's a more interesting and challenging set of questions for politics, for business, for ethics, for religion, for science, for every one of our lives than what are we going to do with ourselves and with other life forms as we move from writing in digital code to writing in life code. I think that will be the biggest single driver of the global economy going forward. And I think it will change all of our societies. Thank you all very much.